All right. <clears throat> My clock says it's 6.33. Am I ahead of the, the game, or does that look about right? 6.34 on my phone. Yep. All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if people want to chime in, ask questions, um, you can. We're trying to limit it to a 30-minute presentation, and I will have time at the end for questions. And I try to ask questions during, I don't know the age group of everyone here, but this is meant for elementary age um, kids and up. Um, hopefully it's interesting to adults too. So um, I'll stop for some questions. If I'm really lagging or it gets, if I talk too fast, now that I can see a couple people, raise your hand and I'll try to slow down a little bit. Thanks. I am going to try to share my screen here. Oops. There we go. And looks like we're there. Does everybody see the slideshow? Yes. Yep. All right, so an introduction. Um, my name is Kim Everson. I'm a veterinarian and I own St. Bernard's Veteran, um, I don't know what I own, St. Bernard's Animal Medical <laughs> Center in Van Dyne. And more recently, I am on the board of the Fond du Lac County Historical Society, and I work on the programming committee. And I was asked to give this presentation because I'd done a little bit of research on the Pyres. And so the presentation itself is called, How Did Pyre School Get Its Name? Um, but it focuses on the Pyre family's impact on Fond du Lac. So here we have a picture of the front of Pyre School. And um, the school was built in 1954. And it was named in honor of the first settlers of Fond du Lac, the Pyres. And the map on the right shows the school with the red arrow. And directly across the street is the property owned by the Fond du Lac County Historical Society and the Galloway House and Village. That yellow striped arrow is pointing kind of where the um, Galloway House is located. It might be hiding underneath the bar with all of our pictures on it. And then not too far, it's within walking distance, is Pyre Cemetery and that's the gray arrow on the bottom. And the reason that this um, the p cemetery is called Pyre Cemetery and, and the school, this particular school is named after the Pyres is because of lo the location of the um, original homestead. So on the left hand side, there's a black and white map and it shows the three properties um, owned by the brothers Colwert and Edward and their father Kelvin. And Kelvin bought his property first in 1836 and the brothers bought theirs um, about three years later. And the red shaded square on the satellite image shows where that is on, like, in real time um, in Fond du Lac. Their property altogether extended from 9th Street to the north to Camelot Drive to the south, from the Fond du Lac River, which is the line of trees on the west side, to Ellis Street on the east side. And I don't think you can see it on the satellite image, but there's a little marker on Kelvin's property showing where the first cemetery was established, Pyre Cemetery. So Colwart and Edward are credited with settling Fond du Lac. They were brothers and they were born in Vermont. Their father, Kelvin, was a tanner and a courier. And this is one of those moments where I'm gonna ask if anybody knows what a tanner and a courier are. Well, a tanner would be somebody that tans hides, I'm assuming. Right. A courier, um, that I have no idea. <laughs> so a courier is a specialist tanner and specifically knew how to waterproof the leather, and I believe also knew some other processes for um, different finishes on the leather. 
they, uh, Colbert and Edward had several siblings, Norman, Oscar, and Oliver, and Caroline and Harriet. And in August 18, 1834, Colbert, Edward, and Oscar left Vermont and headed west to Michigan Territory, which is what Wisconsin was called before it became a state, which was in what year? I know. <laughs> Go ahead, anybody. 1848. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and it took them about four weeks to travel from Vermont to Green Bay. And this picture here shows Green Bay in 1867. So it was about 30 years after they lived there. It was probably much more developed in 1867 than when they lived there. And just as a side here, we only have a picture, a surviving picture of Edward. We don't have any image of Colwart. And there may be many reasons for that, um, but probably the main reason is that unfortunately Colwart died younger. Um, he was in his late 40s when he eventually died. And Edward survived and he became a successful businessman and banker. And so um, he had his image preserved. So as I was saying, um, in 1834, they moved from Vermont to Green Bay, the three brothers, Colbert, Edward, and Oscar. And once they got there, they settled in and they started taking turns traveling. And each brother would go off on a journey and they were looking for the perfect farmland. And they made it as far as Southern Illinois in their journeys. And one of the stories I read um, on the way back, they would pick up odd jobs. And at one point, one of the brothers acted like a cowboy and he drove cattle back <laughs> northward. And so they made money and, and they explored. And in February of 1836, they had met James Duane Doty, who was trying to develop a community at the southern end of Lake Winnebago, which would be the future city of Fond du Lac. And Edward and Colwert set out to look at the proposed site. So this map on the left is a very old map. Um, I don't have the date on it, but I think it's a really cool looking map. We've got Green Bay uh, surrounded by a rectangle and you can see the Fox River and it leads into Lake Winnebago, which is kind of left center. And if you look really carefully at the, the names of the villages around the lake, they are names we don't really use anymore. We've mm -hmm. got White Corn, mm -hmm. Black Wolf Village, Smokers Village, White Bosom Village, Calumet Village, Menominee Village, and some of these names are still in use in some way, like Black Wolf is a township between Fond du Lac and Oshkosh. Um, and then we do have, um, I think there's some villages named Butamore, that's the name of the lake near there. Calumet is obviously still a community. Um, White Corn, I think, might be just south of Nina. I couldn't find um, a direct uh, correlation for the community. Um, it's between Oshkosh and, and Nina, right on the lake shore. White Bosom Village is actually Fond du Lac. Hmm. And um, Smokers Village has a special significance for my family. Um, does anybody know what Smokers Village is now? Called? Van Dyne. Van Dyne, yes. So the, the brothers, um, they had to make a trip from Green Bay all the way down to what would eventually be Fond du Lac. And this is in 1836. Nowadays, we would take Highway 41 along the west side of the lake, or we would take 151 along the east side of the lake. But there were no roads, no highways. There were some Native American trails and some rough roads, but it was, um, it was definitely quite an adventure to take a trip of that type in 1836. And it being February, the brothers were told that the, the best way to travel was to go along the waterways, which were frozen. And so they left Green Bay and they traveled all along the Fox River South until they came to what was called Grand Kakala at the time, and it's now called Kakana. And at that point, they left the waterways and they traveled along the east side of the lake on some rough Native American-made trails. 
um, roads, they called them roads in their documentation, and they made it all the way to what would eventually be the community of Stockbridge on the east side of the lake. And at that point, it was late in the day, and it was a small community, only four or five families, um, and they found a family that was happy to put them up for the night. And they put their horse and sled in their one other building, the shed, and the brothers spent the night with the Jordans. And that was pretty common then because there were no hotels, very few inns or taverns at that point because this was very scarcely settled. And so people had to help each other and they probably enjoyed having company, talking to people they, don't, they didn't know and, and learning the news. So the brothers spent the night with the Jordans and the next day, Mr. Jordan led them to the um, lake shore and he pointed them in the direction of Fond du Lac. And they started out. And the, the lake was snow covered. There was probably about six to eight inches of snow at the time. And remember, this is February. So here's another moment. Um, has anybody been on Lake Winnebago in February? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And does it look anything like the picture on the screen? Yes. <laughs> what what so, is going didn't... on in February on Lake Winnebago? Ice fishing. Ice fishing. Right. So you know, you'll see um, trucks and cars and shanties and Christmas tree lanes um, and lots and lots of people, but obviously none of that on their trip. Um, surprisingly though, it only took them until early afternoon to walk across the lake and they started a campfire and they fed their horse and they had some lunch and then they left their horse and sled and they took off exploring again. They do a lot of exploring. Um, and after several hours, they came back to their camp, and lo and below, below and behold, the Doty party, Doty and his men were waiting for them, which I think is absolutely incredible that in a day and age where you had to make plans weeks and weeks in advance by letter, <laughs> in the wilderness, in February, the Doty party found their campsite and just hung out and waited for them to get back because you can't text each other and say, I'm on my way, just hang on. <laughs> so they had a business meeting and there, were, there was no shelter. So they're basically winter camping and they talk about their plans and, and made some arrangements. And the brothers recorded in their, their letters um, later that it was very bitterly cold. It was so cold that it was notable to them that they went through a huge pile of firewood um, overnight and they didn't get very much sleep, partly probably because of the undertaking that they were about to, to make, but also probably because it was very cold. In the morning, the Doty party um, took off and the brothers set off again to do some exploring. And this time they got a little lost. They did not realize that the Fond du Lac River has two branches. And so it took them a while to figure that out. And when they got oriented again, it was snowing very heavily and they wanted to go home. Um, and they were very concerned that they were gonna get lost. And so they, they described finding themselves in a place where the reeds are higher than a man's head. And they had to use a compass. One brother led the horse and the other said, nope, go a little bit to your left, go a little bit to your right. And they made their way across the lake through the snowstorm to the Jordans again, where they spent the night and then the next day they continued on their way back home to Green Bay. So Colwert is, um, he, he came back first. He moved to, to Fond du Lac first. Um, he was aided by the Native Americans in the area in building a log cabin and um, that's what the picture shows. It's a famous painting by Mark Harrison showing the first home in Fond du Lac. Um, and that is housed at the Galloway House in Village, so you can go see it someday. And the brothers were given land by the Doty Company in exchange for setting up the first inn or tavern, which was called the Fond du Lac House. So they were to live in the house and run a tavern and a trading post. 
if you look at the the um, satellite map I have a red shaded dot over the site of the first settlement which is now Giddings and Lewis the home is long gone that's on the corner of Johnson Street and Brook Street and there is a really nice monument across from Giddings and Lewis on the north side of the Johnson Street Bridge um, you can see the the two monument, monuments in the picture the memorial so Colbert settled first and his wife Fanna had stayed behind in Green Bay and in the early spring she um, made a trip with some other people and they dropped her off at her new home on June 6, 1836. And June 6th is a special day for Fond du Lac. That's our Founders Day. So there's a story that um, about Fanna that when they dropped her off and they said goodbye and everybody left, that she sat down and had a good cry. And I can imagine it was probably very bewildering to be left in the wilderness with no one but your husband um, and no amenities. Um, but it didn't take long and she dusted herself off and got to work. And shortly after she was visited by some of her neighborhood uh, Native American um, ladies and they wanted to do some trading. So she started trading flour and pork for feathers. And she did so much trading that at the end of that um, day, she had enough feathers to make two large feather beds. Oh. <laughs> so the Pyers, like all pioneers, had a lot of amazing stories, tragedies, um, adventures, some, some very scary, some exciting. And fortunately, they kept, they, they kept these stories documented in letters to each other. And that's something that I think we talk about a lot right now with COVID because we want people to document their experiences. And, and we, if we didn't have these letters, we wouldn't have these really interesting stories of the day-to-day -day lives of these people. In one of the letters, it was from November 1836, so just about five months after settling in Fond du Lac, Colbert tells Edward that one of the cows they bought had run away and had been seen wandering the area but had not been caught. It sounded doubtful that they would ever get her back. Also in that same letter, Colbert describes being attacked by a wolf. He's out walking with his dog and a wolf attacks and the dog engages in a fierce battle with the wolf and Colbert is trying to help his dog. And at one point, the wolf bites down on his right hand. And with his left hand, he starts choking the wolf and eventually gets his knife free and he kills the wolf and saves himself. In another letter, about a month later, Colbert and Fanna are running low on supplies. So they write to Edward and they ask him to come from Green Bay with supplies. And it's a, just a terrible, terrible snow, uh, winter storm. It was freezing rain and snow. And everyone in Green Bay said, don't go. It's not, you can't get there. But Edward said he needed to go and get his family the supplies. So he took off and people said the safest way to travel would be by water. And in, in February of that year, the brothers traveled safely to Fond du Lac by water, but this is December. And so as he's crossing Lake Winnebago and, and near the southern point, the horse goes through the lake. And it's so cold and frozen that he cannot get the harness off the horse to free him from the, the probably he had a sled as he did in February. And, so he can't get the harnesses off and then he just tries to keep the horse's head above water and he fails at that and the horse drowns. And that's bad enough, but now Cole, um, Edward is soaking wet in December in a storm an hour before sunset and he doesn't really know how far away his brother's house is. Fortunately, it was only about five football fields away, 550 yards, and he makes it to the house and he, and he stumbles inside and Colbert's not home. <laughs> Colbert had left mm -hmm. to get supplies because <laughs> he didn't know that Edward was on his way, which would have made cell phones very handy. But um, they had passed each other at some point during the day and they had no idea because the weather had been so bad. And the picture of the horse and the man, that's obviously a modern picture. Um, if you look at, look up, 
Google up pictures of horses falling through ice, there are a lot of pictures to choose from, unfortunately. So now um, we've got some pictures of Pyre Cemetery. And if you cannot see all the pictures, you can click and drag the um, zoom bar around if you need to. So over the course of the coming months, a lot of different Pyre relatives started moving to the area. First, Edward and his wife and two little girls, one was only a month old, traveled from Green Bay, and they settled in March of 1837. And then a brother, Norman, sister Harriet, and one of their brother-in-laws moved all the way from Vermont and settled in June of 1837. And then their dad, um, Calvin, and his wife um, came, and they actually settled on 80 acres near Lake Denevue. Later, Edward also bought 160 acres nearby. And around this time, Edward and Colwert were putting in farmland near where the current Fond du Lac County Courthouse is. Sadly, in March of 1838, Fanna Pyre, who was only 30, died after a short illness. And so that unfortunately made a cemetery necessary. And Father Kelvin set aside some land on the corner of his property for the first cemetery, Pyre Cemetery. And um, there's a monument that it, um, lists all the different graves that are present. Um, they're all family members of the Pyres. And underneath the zoom bar in the lower um, right corner is Fanna's grave. And I thought it was interesting. I found this old picture of the cemetery. I don't know the year, but um, you can see it's all farmland in the distance. And that is all well developed. There's um, good <laughs> Goodwill and Tucker's mm -hmm. and a mobile home court and all sorts of different um, neighborhoods back there now. Yep. And you can also see that that um, oak tree. I think the oak tree in the, the picture, the skinny one, is probably the, the one that is present now. So it's been quite a few years. Now we're going to move ahead a generation and um, talk about Colwert Kay. He was the son of Edward and his wife Harriet. He's the nephew of Colwert E. Pyre. He was born June 7th, 1841. And he and his sister Carrie have the distinction of being the first set of white twins born in Fond du Lac County. So these people were pioneers in a lot of ways, and sometimes they didn't have any say in it, but um, <laughs> he grew up working the family farm, but he attended district schools in Fond du Lac, and he was a very good student. He was active in, on the speaking schools and debating clubs, which is probably like forensics nowadays. And he was also an entrepreneur. Between the ages of 12 and 16, he peddled apples and popcorn at local elections, the circus, and Fourth of July celebrations. <laughs> at the age of 16, he moved to Illinois and went to the university in Galesburg and studied law. And when he moved back and was practicing law, in 1861, Fort Sumner fell and started civil war. And he has the distinction of also being the very first man in Fond du Lac to um, join the army, um, the Union Army, to fight in the Civil War. And he had a, a very distinguished career. He completed his first term of service and then returned to practice of law in Fond du Lac, but because the Civil War was ongoing, he decided to raise a group of soldiers and soon became a colonel. This is all around the age of 20, 21, 22 years old. Um, he fought um, under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant, who is famous for another reason. And here's a moment. Does anybody know who Ulysses S. Grant was? Besides a general. He became president. Right. He was the 18th president after the war. Um, another interesting thing about Colwert is that while he was fighting, he was also a war correspondent and he used a pseudonym. And in the, uh, just because of time, a pseudonym is a fake name. And for any students out there, one of the writers that we know best who used a pseudonym was Dr. Seuss. And his real name was Theodore Geisel. Colwert used a really 
interesting pseudonym. He spelled his first name backwards. So it was Trulock. And that's how he signed all of his articles to the paper. He, um, he was shot. He was shot multiple times at the Battle of Petersburg in 1864, but he survived his wounds. And he also had a very heroic um, mission. He, on his own command, took his soldiers and they went after an abandoned Union gun and um, retrieved it and brought it back to their side so that it didn't fall into enemy hands. And he remained in the war until 1865, until the war end. And then he went back to practice law in Fond du Lac and he got married. He married Kate Hamilton in 1866 and they had four children. He practiced law until 1873 and then his career changed very suddenly because he needed to take over management of the savings bank from his father, Edward, who was the president, and Edwin H. Galloway, who was the vice president. They were both suffering health problems and he, he needed to take over. And he took over the bank at a very difficult time because there was a financial panic going on in 1873. And he did a very good job managing the bank. He kept everything going just fine. And he also was instrumental in working with local manufacturers and other businesses in keeping hundreds of local citizens employed, um, which at that time probably kept the community of Fond du Lac alive um, because otherwise those people would have moved off and, and we don't know what would have happened if the community would have survived that. He was also a philanthropist and he raised a lot of money for um, veterans organizations and he continued to write articles for the paper. And I think at one point he even bought into the paper he was a um, shareholder. And he is buried in Pyre Cemetery. And the picture on the left is uh, the Civil War monument in Fond du Lac. Uh, in the background is the county, um, county building, the courthouse, and um, it's right, right on Main Street. And so finally, here we've got another set of pioneers. Um, Colbert married Kate, Kate Hamilton. She was born in Vermont and she moved to Fond du Lac, was raised there, went to school there. And she was a teacher for several years. Her picture is the upper left on both of these sets of images. They married in 1866 and just four years after they were married, her father died. And her mom moved into their household and helped with the domestic duties, raising the children and taking care of the household. And Kate took over her father's large, um, large estate. And she did such a good job running his business that people in the community started coming to her for advice and for help. And so she just kind of fell into a very large real estate business. When her older, the oldest daughter, Kate, announced she wanted to go to law school, Mother Kate said, mm, I'm gonna go with you. And so they went to Wisconsin State University, now UW-Madison, and in 1886, um, they were not the first women to attend law school, but um, they were of the first, certainly the first mother-daughter pair. <laughs> they were very popular in their class, and they finished the two-year program in under a year, well, maybe a little over a year, but basically cut the time in half by taking their junior and senior years at the same time. Um, they, uh, Kate Hamilton was elected the vice president of her senior class too. So when they graduated, they moved back to Fond du Lac and they joined Colwert at his law practice. And they practiced together for a while, but there wasn't enough work. So mother and daughter moved their practice to Milwaukee. After a few years, the other two daughters, Carolyn and Harriet, also went to UW-Madison and graduated and moved to Milwaukee to practice with mother and Kate. And they had a very successful business. They were bilingual in German and English. And at least one of them also spoke Polish, which at the time was really helpful in Milwaukee because we had a huge immigrant population of Germans and Poles. And so they were able to communicate with their clients in their native language. 
they all specialized in a different area of civil law. One, for example, specialized in probate law, which is the type of law that handles estates after someone dies and wills. Another was a maritime lawyer, so she handled shipping um, legal issues. And in 1891, Mrs. Kate Pyer was appointed the Milwaukee County Court Commissioner. So they had a very successful, very pioneering career. Um, remarkable, not only then, but even now, for a family of four women, all, all related to being such, <laughs> such uh, good practice, law practice. These are some of the references I used. Um, if anyone wants more information. Um, I think it's just remarkable that the Pyers, they were a pioneer, the pioneer family in so many different ways, and it is not surprising at all that Fond du Lac would want to honor them and remember them by naming one of the elementary schools after them. So at this point, does anybody have any questions? I, I have a question about their the pronunciation of their last name. Uh, I would, if I just read it, I would say Pierre, mm -hmm. but uh, evidently they were uh, German heritage. I don't know. You don't know. Okay. I would that that would be a good assumption because they were um, German speaking. Yes, that's that's kind of what led me there. But it's it it wouldn't be the pronunciation that I would would guess. No, just that's, reading it. That's but. a good point. And in German, isn't the second vowel the one that's that's heard? Right. So, so, so in it would be pier in that case. Yeah, I don't know why they pronounce huh. it higher. <laughs> I always thought it was French because Fondelac was French, but I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I wonder if I can find that answer. I have not seen references to their heritage in any of the, the documents. The middle, um, the middle book, uh, that was published in 1880, and it's about four inches thick, and it's got a lot of interesting information, but that is not something that I saw mentioned. <laughs> So it might be in some of their other letters. Um, and there are a lot of documents at the, the um, Thornton Library at the Galloway House. Not open now, of course, because of COVID, but um, certainly available for more research. You also mentioned earlier that the, the Dodies um, offered, uh, evidently that you, that I, I assume that they had a business, the Dodies, or a company? Right. You, James Dwayne Doty had the Fond du Lac company, and so he what was, was that? He, he had permission to sell property in order to set up the community. Okay. And so that's why, um, looking back at that very first map, Kelvin moved to the area after the brothers, but he bought property first. In 1836 and the brothers brought, bought property in 1839 because they didn't have to initially they were given the land to set up the Fond du Lac house the first tavern and once they became successful they started buying up land so also back then when they when they would go to get supplies now did they um the Wade house isn't that East, oh, I can't think of the, right. the name of the toward, she toward Sheboygan, Plymouth and Sheboygan. Yeah, so basically, wasn't there a plank road established? Not initially, that took a while. There's some in the um, the Fond du Lac County, a gift of the glacier by Michael Mensner. And Michael Mensner was the editor of the Fond du Lac Reporter for many years, and he put together an amazing book with lots of great pictures. There are some really interesting stories about the Plank Road and the stagecoach trail to the Wade House, and it was a horrible trip. 
it was so bad that um, Philip Hoon, who was a politician from New York, he had traveled, he wrote a lot of journals and letters and he wrote, it was absolutely terrible. I think that was before the plank road got put in and I don't know the year of that. Okay. There were other small communities in the area, um, settlers, like on the east side of the lake, there would be four or five families. Um, Fanna Pyre, when she came in June, she was traveling with another lady um, who was going to move to another um, a homestead that was in the area. It might have been a Doty property, I don't know. So there were other people around, but they were the first settlers of the city of Fond du Lac. And so, didn't, um, Oops, sorry. No, and didn't, um, um, James Jordan, didn't he work to have Fond du Lac be the capital of Wisconsin? I thought I had heard that it was in contention. Um, they went with Madison because the land it was better land or something. Do you know if there's um, truth to that, that Fond du Lac was in the running to be capital? I don't know. I think you may be right. There were a lot of different communities that were suggested, sure. and Madison was not. From what I understand, Madison wasn't an ideal spot. It was very much, right. there's all the lakes and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Fond du Lac probably would have been a pretty good spot. It was, um, you know, a highly traveled area. It's still the corridor, the Fox River corridor right. of trade and, and commerce and population. It would have made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Was was the the Fond du Lac River, was that a navigable waterway later on um, for like the steamboat trade at all? Do you know? I don't know. Okay, because that that got to be a big deal on the on the Great Lakes. Um, I'm reading in that book that you gave me for Christmas about the uh, lost cities of Wisconsin. Um, you know, the steamboat trade was a big deal. Um, and that they could actually travel down the Fox um, all the way down to Portage uh, with the use of locks and such. And I was just wondering if there was any trade at all in the Fond du Lac area where they where the river, if it was ever really big enough and deep enough for, for any amount of trade to travel that way. But I don't know the answer to that. Lots of leapfrogging going on here. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. If anybody has any additional questions, I'd be happy to take them, even if I don't know the answers. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, I'm just question was, was this presentation that you gave, is that something you might be willing to share with students at Pyre Elementary School? Live and in her, person? You know, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't have to answer me now, you know. Oh, I would love to. I know. Awesome. Oh, awesome. that'd be wonderful. I can't wait to do that kind of thing again. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Cause, I mean, like I said, you know, like history is in the third grade social studies standards. So, no, that would be, that'd be wonderful. I mean, especially, you know, obviously our schools have the significant, you know, right. importance to us. So, yeah, that'd be great. I would love that. I would love to do that. Awesome. Thank you for asking. Cool. And I, I would of like course. to. I'd like to invite people who have ideas on other topics to email us. This is a new program that we're doing um, and we'd like to continue to do live or online programming for all ages. So if you have other topics you're interested in or if you know of anyone who's willing to present, that would be even better. Um, just email us and uh, <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> So thank you very much. This presentation will be saved. Um, I hope it's been recording and I'll get it uploaded so that you can access it later if you need to. Thank you, thank you so, you so much. much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank have you good too. Night, so. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Very good. Bye.